So I'd like to tell you about our guest tonight. Uh, John D'Amelio is Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, his area of study is history and gender and women's studies. Uh, John worked in the field of LGBTQ history and has, and has had a far reaching impact and is considered a pioneer in the field of gay and lesbian studies. He earned a PhD from Columbia University, as well as other degrees there, and is one of the first academics and activists in the country to begin work on gay scholarship. So we are just so pleased to have him with us tonight to learn about the subject. Um, so welcome, John. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity, and especially to be able to talk about a history that isn't widely known. And so just to give you a kind of sense of it, uh, before I pull up my PowerPoint, uh, I'll be giving you a broad overview of LGBTQ activism from the beginning of the 50s when it first gets started until the very early 2000s. And as you'll see in the talk, a vast amount of change occurs in the course of those 50 plus years. So give me a moment now. Okay, so has the uh, has it come up as a uh... hello? No, we don't have you. We haven't seen your shared screen yet. Oh, okay. So, oh, damn. All right. Um... All right. Okay, and now let me do this. Let's see if this will work. Okay, is it uh, is it yeah. up now? Yeah, okay. that's good. Yeah. All right, good. So, uh, well, uh, I want to start with uh, what I describe as the worst time to be queer in the United States: uh, the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, oppression is really out there, it's undisguised, and it's aggressive, and it shows itself in many different ways. For instance, in 1950, a U.S. Senate committee issued a report titled The Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government. Uh, here is a memorable line from the report, one homosexual can pollute an entire government office. When Eisenhower became president in 1953, he almost immediately issued an executive order that banned the employment of all LGBT people from federal government jobs, as well as jobs with government contractors. So for instance, the entire defense industry. During these years also, the military engages in witch, witch hunts and discharges a couple of thousand LGBT people every year. The FBI engages in intense surveillance of what it described as sex offenders and sex deviates. It accumulated over 330,000 pages of information on people. Uh, also during this, this period of time, Homosexual behavior is a crime in every state. Uh, the police entrap uh, gay men, they raid gay and lesbian bars and execute mass arrests of people. Uh, many states and cities, including Chicago, have laws against what was called cross-dressing, uh, wearing the clothes of the other gender or sex, so that, for instance, here's an example, women wearing pants that had a zipper in the front could be arrested for violating the cross-dressing laws. And I'll show you some headlines from the Tribune during the 50s that capture, at 50s and 60s that capture this. Uh, here are articles about the Senate probes, moral misfits fleeing posts in State Department, uh, probers assail US hiring of sex perverts. Also, when the police raid bars, the Tribune would have articles about it. Uh, vice charges against 58, file charges against 87. And what these articles are describing are raids of gay bars where 
police just went into the bars and arrested everybody who was there. Under these circumstances, as you, as you can imagine, people lived in the closet. Uh, wearing a mask was the phrase that was most often used in this period. People pretended in their lives uh, to family, to neighbors, to friends at work that they were heterosexual or gender conforming. Occasionally, someone becomes visible, but it's usually against their will and as an attack upon them. One notable example of this, um, Bayard Rustin, who is a very important activist for peace, racial justice, and economic equality. Rustin is best known as the organizer of that iconic 1963 March on Washington, where Dr. King gives his I Have a Dream speech. Two weeks before the march, a segregationist senator from South Carolina revealed in the Senate that the organizer of the event was what he described as a sex pervert. Now, Rustin survives the attack, the civil rights movement backs him, but it's a good example of the vulnerability that people faced. During these years, the most visible cultural representation of LGBT life were so-called lesbian pulp novels. They were sold in drugstores and newsstands everywhere. They were scandalous and negative in their portrayal of lesbians. The covers are offensive, but they capture the times, and I'll show you just a couple to give you a sense of, of what this is. Uh, Here's one, warped, twisted passions in the twilight world, or degraded women. And honestly, these, these cheap paperbacks sold hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of copies. So under these circumstances, how do LGBTQ people respond? What forms of resistance start to appear? In response to the intensity of the oppression, a continuous history of LGBTQ activism and organizing finally starts around 1950. Uh, in, Los in California, the Mattachine is founded in 1950-51. One Incorporated was an offshoot, which and they published a monthly magazine called One Magazine. In San Francisco, a lesbian organization formed called the Daughters of Belitis. Uh, these organizations hold meetings, they have public lectures, they publish magazines. The Mattachine and the Daughters uh, established chapters in a few other cities and Chicago had chapters of both of them on and off. But as you can imagine, given the times, it was a very cautious kind of activism. Uh, many members of these organizations use pseudonyms so as not to expose themselves. Um, they try to take a reasonable and responsible approach. They're not in any way militant. I mean, the names of the organizations, would you even know, looking at them, that they were any kind of LGBTQ organization? But even so, for the relatively small number of people who encounter them and learn about them, they are life-saving organizations and people join and subscribe to their magazines. Um, during these years also, in terms of thinking about resistance, a small number of individuals do try to push the envelope without being part of organizations. Uh, Christine Jorgensen, for instance, was the first American to have what in those years was called sex change surgery. Today, we would describe it as gender affirmation surgery. This happened in 1952, made headlines in newspapers around the country. And she really made an effort to stay visible and public so that other trans people would have her as a model. Another individual, Valerie Taylor, a Chicago-based novelist in the 50s and 60s. And what Taylor did was to take that lesbian pulp genre and write novels that portrayed lesbians in a positive way. And so she had some books like Whisper Their Love or The Girls in 3B, A World Without Men. 
Another person, Jose Saria, he was what was described as a drag performer in San Francisco in the 50s and early 60s. And in the late 50s, as the police engaged in a long series of huge raids of gay bars, Saria responds by, in 1961, running for city supervisor in San Francisco. He doesn't win, but he's the first LGBTQ per person to openly run for public office. Now, by the time we get to the mid 60s, some homophile activists and groups are becoming more visible and assertive. Partly it's the influence of the African-American civil rights movement, which is making collective protests and dem demands for equality more commonplace. Uh, in Washington, DC, there's someone named Frank Kameny. He had been an astronomer in the 50s who worked for the federal government, but was fired from his job when the FBI found out that he was gay. Uh, Kameny forms a Mattachine chapter in Washington, DC, and takes on the role of going after the federal government ban on hiring LGBTQ people. He helps organize the very first public demonstrations of activists that ever occur in Washington, DC in 1965. Here you can see a small picket line outside uh, the White House. Um, here's a, an, another one of the uh, pickets. Um, by 1968, uh, a, a conference of homophile activists, as they describe themselves, adopted the slogan, gay is good. Um, in a sense, it was responding, taking example from the black movement that was using the phrase black is beautiful. By the second half of the 60s, the upheavals that are going on all across the country are starting to reach into the LGBT community. Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Los Angeles all saw rowdy, disruptive public demonstrations in response to police harassment of bars. Um, building on what militant African Americans were doing and saying, activists in Chicago began using the phrase gay power in the late 1960s. And with such things starting to happen, in June of 1969, when police in New York City raid a Greenwich Village bar called the Stonewall Inn, the patrons of the bar fought back and several nights of rioting ensued. And Stonewall um, becomes the symbolic marker of a major, <clears throat> excuse me, historical turning point, the birth of what in those years was described as a gay liberation movement. And by the following spring, 1970, there is enough new militant angry activism by a younger generation influenced by the 60s that activists in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago all have a march and rally to commemorate the first anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion. Uh, and of course, now pride parades and marches are held all around the globe in June and millions of people attend. Uh, I'll show you uh, uh, a few image, some, some images of these first demonstrations and you can see how different they look from that orderly picket line I showed you a moment or two ago. Um, Gay Liberation Day 1970, you can see kind of them shouting, the anger showing. Uh, here's a, a banner, the all power to butch bull dykes, um, all power to the people. Uh, and a key element of this new militant liberation movement was the call to come out, to come out of the closet, to reject shame, reject secrecy, and declare yourself, make yourself visible to everyone. And the first uh, LGBTQ publication in New York that came out after Stonewall was given the title, Come Out, uh, and you know, which emphasizes the importance of, of this notion. So 
with this new militant kind of activism, what changes in the 1970s? Um, for one thing, there is an explosion of organizations. At the time of Stonewall, there, after almost 20 years, there were maybe 50 LGBTQ organizations in the US. By 1974, five years after Stonewall, there are almost a thousand. Some last, some come and go quickly, but they bring people together, make collective activism and community building possible, and they have a wide range of missions. You have local activist all-purpose organizations, you have religious organizations of gay Catholics, gay Episcopalians, um, you know, synagogues for gay and lesbian Jews, uh, there are cultural organizations, uh, singing groups, theater troops, uh, music festivals and film festivals, organizations that start to provide health and social services to members of the community in need. And you also have the first national organizations like Lambda Legal Defense Fund, an organization of lawyers that took on legal cases or the National Gay Task Force, which became a, a lobbying organization for change. A second development is what I would call just a cultural representation. Um, like that publication come out, activists, publish lots of other magazines and newspapers so that they're not dependent on the kinds of things that the Chicago Tribune might publish. Uh, the covers of the publications really make it clear. Here is one called Lesbian Tide. You know, it's right out there. Or Fag Rag, a gay male newspaper. Uh, there are also small publishing firms that come together to publish LGBTQ positive novels and books. Uh, one of those that's published in the early 70s is a novel called Ruby Fruit Jungle. It's probably the most widely read lesbian novel of the last 50 years. A third change is the winning of allies. Major organizations like the ACLU, the American Bar Association, the National Council of Churches and the American Psychological Association begin to support the repeal of criminalizing laws and also the passage of civil rights non-discrimination bills. And I should mention that at this point, all of the gains that we're talking about are around the issue of sexual orientation. Gender identity isn't yet asserting itself with the kind of uh, collective action visibility in the 70s that it's starting to have now. A fourth development in the, of change in the 70s was that there were some real victories. Uh, uh, from this list, I'll mention just a couple. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association in 1973 eliminates homosexuality from its list of me mental illnesses. The federal civil service, the federal government doesn't eliminate the ban, but limits it to only jobs involving national security. Uh, the first states begin to repeal their sodomy laws. Illinois actually is the first one. And a few small cities and towns, usually liberal university towns, begin passing sexual orientation, uh, non-discrimination bills. Uh, and there, you know, there are a few other things too, like challenging the military ban and the police backing away in some big cities from bar raids. What doesn't change in the 1970s, however? Even though the change that occurs is significant, it's still uneven and limited. So that for instance, the overwhelming majority of LGBTQ people are still living in the closet. They have not yet come out. The community, the population is also internally divided. There are organizations for men and there are organizations for women. There are organizations that are basically all white and then there are organizations for people of color. There are organizations of gender conforming people and then there are organizations of transgender people. 
Uh, in the 70s, there was a whole movement within a movement called lesbian feminist separatism because the gay movement was seen as too sexist and the women's movement was seen as too homophobic. Lesbians create a whole set of women only institutions and organizations for themselves. So meanwhile, <clears throat> even as the 60s give birth to LGBTQ radical and militant activism, it also spawns an organized counterattack. And in the 70s, a politicized Christian evangelical movement begins to rise up. And the first high profile public targeting of the movement comes in Dade County, Miami, Florida, in 1977, where the county passes a sexual orientation non-discrimination law. And in response to that, Anita Bryant, um, a former beauty pageant contestant, a popular singer, a spokesperson in advertising for the Florida citrus industry, takes on the law and becomes the leading figure in a repeal campaign uh, to through a voter referendum. And in June of 77, voters overwhelmingly choose to repeal the statute. Bryant then makes this a movement. She travels around the country, the mess giving speeches. The message that she uses is save our children from homosexuality. And three other cities around the country also repeal their non-discrimination statutes. The biggest of these campaigns uh, comes in California in 1978, uh, where um, there's a statewide ballot initiative called, it's Proposition 6, it's called the Briggs Initiative after the member of the legislature who sponsored it. And it would have required the firing of any school employee known to be LGBTQ or any school employee who spoke favorably about homosexuality. Now, fortunately, this leads activists in California to mobilize like never before. It's a massive statewide organizing campaign, the biggest yet. Uh, and Proposition 6 is defeated here. This was a demonstration of Californians against Briggs. And Anita Bryan generally, you can say, I mean, by giving such vocal visibility to homophobia has the effect of bringing more folks out of the closet and increasing the ranks of activism. Pride marches in 1977 and 1978 were larger by far than they had ever been. This is one in New York and you can see that, you know, they're targeting Anita Bryant. Uh, Bryant appeared in Chicago in 1977. Uh, at the Medina Temple, and it led to the largest LGBTQ demonstration that Chicago had ever seen up until that point. And one of the activists who was interviewed uh, by a journalist at that demonstration said, you know, was quoted as saying, every kick is a boost. In other words, sometimes political enemies can prove helpful. So by the end of the 70s, the beginnings of the society we live in now were starting to take shape. There's some visibility, there's openness, there's organizations, there's activism, there are even some significant victories. But it's still the early stages of change. And as the 80s begin, things aren't looking so good because with Ronald Reagan's election in 1980, this gave the evangelical conservatives a voice in national politics since they were part of the coalition that elected Reagan. And then just as this wave of counter conservative attacks is about to take off, something new enters the scene, the AIDS epidemic. And as we will see in a variety of ways, AIDS changes everything. AIDS was new, scary, uncontrollable. The first cases were reported in the summer of 1981. 
groups of young men in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, were developing a rare kind of cancer and pneumonia, and their immune systems had lost the ability to fight infection. The common factor reported in these early cases was that they were all homosexuals. And initially, what today we describe as AIDS was called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. Uh, the media talked about gay cancer. That was their the media handle. The media talked about risk groups. There was a lot of stereotyping and labeling. And the number of deaths explodes. Um, in 1981, by the end of 81, a total of 166 people in the US had died. By 1992, 11 years later, almost 200,000 people had died and most are dying within a year of diagnosis. And for the first several years, there's almost no press coverage of this. And then in 1985, Rock Hudson is revealed to have AIDS. And, you know, people might not remember, but Rock Hudson was a Hollywood icon in the 50s and 60s. And so when he goes public with AIDS, it becomes, you know, front page on a magazine like Newsweek. Uh, when he dies, front page article in the Los Angeles Times. And the response of the media and the general public is that, oh my God, suddenly anyone can get AIDS and it's all because of those homosexuals. And so panic sets in. There are proposals to quarantine people with AIDS, to uh, compulsory tattoo them so people will know they have AIDS. Uh, people are uh, evicted from their housing or denied care in hospitals. Congress uh, in 1986 passes something called the Helms Amendment. Uh, Jesse Helms was a senator from North Carolina and he amended a budget act so that no federal funds could be used to promote homosexuality. Well, how do you engage in AIDS education and prevention work if you can't do anything that might promote homosexuality? Ronald Reagan, the president says nothing about it, the epidemic for the first five years, but it mobilizes the LGBT community like never before. The initial response is local, locally based, self-help uh, organizations form to take care of people with AIDS who are not getting help anywhere else. Um, there's also deep lesbian involvement. Um, in the 70s, uh, feminism, lesbian feminism had a political analysis to the healthcare system and medical care. And so lesbians get deeply involved helping gay men in a way that unlike the 70s when men and women operated in different worlds. Uh, there's also AIDS requires local political organizing, getting cities and counties and even states to respond positively and provide funding uh, to provide service delivery and get public health agencies to respond. Uh, also local educations about risk reduction after HIV is identified in 1984. And just as all of this local self-help and mobilization is occurring as the epidemic spreads, in 1986, the Supreme Court issues a decision in Bowers versus Hardwick in which they say that sodomy laws, you know, laws criminalizing homosexuality are constitutional. One of the opinions says there is no such thing as a fundamental right to commit homosexual sodomy. They say the challenge to the sodomy laws was facetious. It would overturn millennia of moral teaching. Well, in the context of both gay liberation, but especially the suffering of the AIDS epidemic, you can imagine how enraging this decision was. And if you combine Hardwick with AIDS, the impact on activism was impressive. And as an example, in 1979, 10 years after Stonewall, the movement organized its first March on Washington. 
maybe 100,000 people came to it. Not bad, but not as big as what happened in the 60s. Eight years later in 1987, six years into the epidemic and a year after Hardwick, 500,000 people turn out for a, demonstra for a demonstration and rally in Washington. It's the largest demonstration in Washington in US history. So by the second half of the 80s, AIDS is really mobilizing the community like and the movement like never before. And it's going beyond local you know, self-help. Uh, there is a, a shift to, uh, to public activism and, and militant public activism. And a key moment comes uh, in 1986-87, where direct action protest groups start to form in a number of cities, including Chicago. And lots of activists deserve credit for that, but I want to highlight one in particular because he had a very high media profile, Larry Kramer. He had been a Hollywood screenwriter. He wrote a, a, a novel in the 1970s called Faggots, which was a gay positive novel. In 1983, he writes an article in the gay press called 1,112 and counting. That was the number of people who had died at that point. And he says, you know, we have to do something about this. He writes a play, The Normal Heart, that premieres in 1984 about AIDS, and it immediately travels around the country. And in 1987, he gives a speech at the New York City LGBT Community Center in which he says, we're going to die, all of us, unless we get angry and do something. And out of that forms an organization called ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And ACT UP groups form all around the country, not just in like, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, but Shreveport, Louisiana, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they engage in very disruptive actions. Uh, they disrupt the New York Stock Exchange during the middle of a business day. They conduct a die-in in Chicago in Daly Plaza in the middle of a work day. They block the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco during rush hour, invade the Food and Drug Administration in Maryland. And in New York City, they invade St. Patrick's Cathedral, the Catholic Church, to protest during a mass of the Cardinal there, who had been very anti-gay and anti-AIDS. And they get, ACT UP gets lots of media coverage, and I'm going to show you a, a number of images which gives you a sense of both uh, their, their anger in demonstration and the messages that they put out. Um, silence, equals, silence equals death, t-shirts, that was their major slogan. Um, you know, you can see the anger and determination in their faces here uh, in their demonstrations. Uh, this is in Chicago, a demonstration against the Cardinal uh, at that point in Chicago. Uh, here is a, a, the poster, Silence Equals Death. Again, they don't hold back attacking a Catholic Cardinal. Uh, Reagan, he kills me. People of color, the effect that AIDS is having on them one AIDS death every half hour, the government has blood on its hands. And here's a, an image of, of a particular, Danny Sotomayor was a Chicago ACT UP activist who was also a political cartoonist and his political cartoons really take no prisoners. Here's one, I mentioned the Helms Amendment. This is an image of Jesse Helms talking to Adolf Hitler. Uh, a, a cartoon of Danny Sotomayor. Now, at the same time that ACT UP is taking off, uh, there's another powerful response that begins, though of a very different nature, and that is the Names Project Memorial Quilt. It starts in San Francisco. People are encouraged to make quilt panels 
to commemorate those whom they loved who had died of AIDS. It debuts at the 1987 March on Washington. There's a huge display of it on the Washington Mall, and then it travels around the country. Uh, in the summer of 88, there's a big exhibit of it on Navy Pier in Chicago that tens of thousands of people come to visit. And it has the effect of making the price of AIDS and lives lost very, very real. And I'll, I'll just show you some examples of the panels where, <clears throat> excuse me, as you'll see, it's more than just the name. You learn something about the person. So Gregorio Ramirez, the Mexican flag. David Thompson, the schools he went to. Neil LaMonaco, a, a, a cellist. This was made by the daughter of someone, uh, of, of a man who, a father who died of AIDS. This, this quilt panel was made by the neighbor of Joseph Tucci. Uh, Roger Gale Lyon was the first activist to speak before Congress about the AIDS epidemic and died. Um, so, um, you know, there's a lot is going on. And, um, and you, by the early 1990s, this level of protest is really making addition, a, a difference because the community is now working as part of a national coalition of doctors, social workers, uh, nurses, public health workers to get funding for research, treatment, education, and protection against discrimination. And by the early 90s, they're really working not just at the local level, but at the national level, and they have some real victories. In 1990, the Ryan White Care Act is a huge funding act passed by Congress to support fighting the AIDS epidemic. The Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 includes HIV status as uh, a disability against which you cannot discriminate. The Hate Crime Statistics Act also in 1990, for the first time, the federal government is collecting statistics on hate crimes based on sexual orientation. And as a marker of change in 1992, Bill Clinton becomes the first presidential candidate of a major party to actively seek out the support of the LGBT community, speak to com on community issues and to members of the community. Now, I said before, you know, when I first started talking about AIDS, AIDS changes everything. Let me give some other examples. Um, it leads to really a massive coming out. Uh, far more people come out in the 80s than did in the 70s, uh, because now it seems to, it's like a matter of life and death. It's not just a question of, oh, sexual freedom or sexual liberation, but our lives depend upon this. Also, um, as, um, as this occurs, as there's both government funding for AIDS, but as more people are joining organizations, uh, and after, especially after the 1987 March on Washington that half a million people go to, organiza LGBT organizations are able to make the shift from all volunteer to paid staff. And with these full-time paid staff, they're much more stable and can have a more, a bigger impact. And, and it also, leads at the national level to organizations being able to work with a whole bunch of other mainstream organizations to form alliances to fight against AIDS, but also to fight against sexual orientation discrimination. And it's, it's no accident uh, that in 1986, New York, and in 1988, Chicago, you know, at that point, the two largest cities in the US both pass non-discrimination laws based on sexual orientation and other cities and states are doing it as well. Also, you know, with the lobbying that people are doing uh, to get AIDS funding and a response, 
they're learning the system, more and more LGBTQ people start to run for public office and get engaged in electoral politics. And the change doesn't stop here. Um, there's another impact is a much heightened level of visibility and organizing among LGBTQ people of color. Um, the Black and Latinx community is disproportionately affected by AIDS, but there, there haven't been prioritized either by white-led AIDS organizations or mainstream Black and Latinx organizations. So by the late 1980s and early 1990s, especially as more funding is becoming available to fight AIDS, there's a profusion of new LGBTQ people of color organizations. Yego, uh, a national Latino, Latina, lesbian, and gay organization. A national black lesbian and gay leadership forum. A minority AIDS project in Los Angeles that becomes a model for communities all over the country. Uh, a national minority AIDS coalition. And you know, in terms of local examples, in 1993, the Bud Billiken Parade, which is held every year in the Af on the African American South Side in Chicago, for the first time, an openly LGBTQ contingent marches in the parade. Two years later in Chicago, an organization of women loving women Latinas forms Amigas Latinas, and they become a major activist organization in Chicago for the next 20 years. Another change, increased visibility and, organiz and organizing among bisexuals and transgender people. AIDS led to the targeting of bisexuals. The media presents them as responsible for spreading this gay disease into the general population. Bisexual organizing really takes off. Um, in 1990, uh, Binet is a national organization that holds its first national conference. When the movement holds another March on Washington in 1993, it's called a March for Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Rights. AIDS also leads to much more organizing among transgender people. Uh, trans women especially were disproportionately affected by AIDS. Uh, and the sexual orientation dis anti-discrimination laws don't include transgender people. And so there's much more organizing beginning in the 90s and continuing into the 21st century. There's a new transgender literature, a number of um, um, transgender writers publish uh, novels and memoirs. And by the late 90s, uh, the movement is basically using LGBT to refer to itself. Another change a completely different level of cultural visibility. In 1993, for instance, 94, Tom Hanks stars in a movie called Philadelphia where he plays a gay man with AIDS. Uh, he wins an Oscar for it. On Broadway, a play by Tony Kushner, Angels in America is produced. It wins many awards and travels around the country. Uh, MTV, one of the first reality cable stations, uh, its first reality uh, program is called The Real World. And in 1994, uh, they feature Pedro Zamora, the first out gay man to appear on reality television. Uh, and he's both, he's an AIDS activist and a man with AIDS. And then uh, in 1996, 97, Ellen DeGeneres uh, had a TV series called Ellen. And in that season, basically she spends the whole season, you know, through like 24 episodes, slowly, slowly, slowly coming out until in effect you have millions of Americans basically watching and saying, come out already. We know, you know, come out. Um, so that the cultural visibility is a real change. There's also a new level of involvement in national politics, which turns out to be very complex. Uh, in 1993, 
during Clinton's first year, there's what re got referred to as the gays in the military debate. Um, Clinton had promised to repeal the military ban. The Defense Department and the military opposed it. Congress opposed it. It was a news story for six months. And finally, uh, what happens is they adopt, they don't repeal the ban, but they adopt something called don't ask, don't tell. So as long as LGBTQ people remain completely in the closet so that no one knows who they are, they won't be discharged. The military is not going to investigate, but as soon as it becomes public, you can still be discharged. The marriage issue begins to appear in the 90s after uh, a court in Hawaii legalizes same-sex marriage in the state. In 1996, Congress passes the Defense of Marriage Act, which basically says uh, that no, the fed, no federal programs or benefits will go to same-sex couples in states that allow gay marriage. And in 1996 and 2004, in both of those presidential election years together, a majority of states have ballot initiatives, voter referendums, in which voters vote to no marriage equality in our states. And so, you know, the message at this point in the 90s is that even though there are tremendous victories at the local and the state level and the fighting around AIDS, this new involvement in national politics can still lead to significant defeats. But then sometimes there's a historic victory. And in 2003, a Supreme Court decision in Lawrence versus, versus Texas reverses the Hardwick decision and basically decriminalizes homosexuality throughout the United States. And this is a significant historic marker. Uh, you know, homosexual behavior had been a crime from the beginning of the colonies in the 1600s. <clears throat> and now criminality is no longer the starting point. So uh, there's a whole lot that could be said about the last two decades. Uh, you know, the way the marriage campaign played out in a number of states. And finally, uh, in 2015, there's marriage equality through a Supreme Court decision, a tremendous amount of school, youth organizing at the school level, uh, gay straight alliances or queer straight alliances form in thousands of schools around the United States. And it's during the 21st century that gender identity and trans visibility really becomes um, significant. So there's much that could be said about all of these things, but, and other things as well. But uh, I'm basically going to stop here. Uh, I want to mention two things uh, in closing. One, if you're not aware of it, Chicago has an organization called the Gerber Hart Library and Archives. Uh, that's its uh, website, www.gerberhart.org. And it is basically an LGBTQ library and historical museum and archives. It has exhibits, it has research archives. And if you were to go to their website, uh, it would provide you with a lot of information about Midwest and Chicago LGBTQ history. And finally, just a tiny bit of self-promotion. Um, one of my most recent books was based entirely on doing research at Gerber Hart. It's called Queer Legacies, Stories from Chicago's LGBTQ Archives. Uh, and uh, it consists of about three dozen short chapters that talk about different people, organizations, events in Chicago's LGBT history from the 1950s up through the 21st century. So um, uh, let me stop here. Uh, uh, Roz, let me know if there are questions. Um, you know, um, tell yeah, me what absolutely. they are. Yeah, um, so do you wanna stop sharing your screen? Yes, I'm, I'm yes. There you okay. go, perfect. Well, I have a couple of questions for you, John. One is, 
Well, thank you for a really wonderful presentation that was so well organized and covered so many interesting <laughs> subjects. And I was just wondering, I know you've been considered kind of really like a leader in this area of study. And I was wondering whether you had anything on your plate that you were currently working on in terms, and I, you mentioned your, your collection of short stories. Is there anything else kind of on your horizon? Well, I'd actually like to take, what I would love to do is to take this talk, which I've been giving a lot, and, and actually write a, relative, a short book, you know, like 200, 250 pages that gives a broad overview and actually goes up to the present, doesn't stop, you know, mm -hmm. with the Lawrence decision. Uh, because I think it's the, the kind of book that, you know, folks could read and would get used in a lot of college classes as well. Uh, my working, I haven't started it yet, although I've collected a lot of material, but I haven't started the writing. But the working title I have is Armies of Lovers, <laughs> A History of LGBTQ Activism in the US. Love it. And let me ask you, I read something when I was like kind of getting your bio together that some of your work was cited in the Lawrence versus Texas decision. Can you just tell us about that? Yes. Uh, well, one of the books that I've written, um, uh, I've co-written it with one of, with my best friend and closest collaborator, uh, Estelle Friedman, who's a historian as well. And we wrote a book together called Intimate Matters, A History of Sexuality in America. So it's not simply an LGBT book, but it goes from the colonial period through the end of the 20th century and gives you a broad overview of how sexual values, patterns of sexual behavior, sexual politics have changed. And um, the, uh, the, the decision in the Lawrence case uh, cites the book and also quotes it in one of the footnotes. Uh, so it was very touching, you know, when to realize that, oh my God, they read this and it, it helped shape their thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't imagine how um, how exciting it must have been. And I know that you you talk a lot. I mean, obviously you live in Chicago, but you give a lot of examples of the role that Chicago played in activism over the last um, several decades. Um, so it's just interesting to kind of have that local um, perspective. But I also was wondering whether you were familiar with the book The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay. Oh my, I love it. I okay, totally yeah. love it. It's okay. a wonderful novel. I mean, it's both a wonderful novel, but as a historian, it's amazing how well she got the history. Mm -hmm. And one thing to know about it is that she did a good bit of research at the Gerber Hart Library oh, in, wow. okay. in Chicago uh, so that she could ground her fictional story in real events in Chicago. Yeah, I've met her before. I think she's fantastic. Yes. Um, and yeah, I think her book... Um, which for those for people that are watching, it talks about it's set in Chicago and it talks about the AIDS crisis in Chicago and the people that were affected by it. And um, I just love that, like, I never read anything like that before. And it was just, you know, wonderful book. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a page turning novel. It's very touching and warm and, you know, there'll be a few tears and yes, it's really a lovely book. Yeah, okay, good. Um, well, anyhow, I just, um, I don't know if we have any other questions, but I just really just wanted to thank you for a really wonderful presentation. Um, just so many interesting things <laughs> to like, to like to learn about. And um, I guess if we are going to record this, I will send this out to people that registered and didn't join us tonight. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, John. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. So long. I'm going to log off. Okay.